And so we've got Anthony Ryder from South Lyon, Michigan, recently selected as the Lions 2020 Fan of the Year. He has a passion about sports broadcasting. With the 112th selection in the 2021 NFL Draft, the Detroit Lions select Amon Ross St. Brown, wide receiver, USC. One cry, baby! It is officially draft day. It is April 25th, and in just a couple of hours, the NFL draft will be underway. The Chicago Bears will be on the clock at one, and the rest of the draft will follow suit. And today, we are going to take a look at a 32-team first-round live mock draft to really wrap up draft season and get a look at the entirety of the first round and how it may play out for each and every team. So with that being said... Let's just kick it right off. Obviously, starting off with the first overall pick by the Chicago Bears. And uh, honestly, quite obviously, it is going to be Caleb Williams, the best prospect in this class. I think he's got really good arm talent, great mobility. I think he plays better in the pocket than a lot of people give him credit for. He's good in the pocket. He's good out of the pocket. He's good in structure. He's good out of structure, can make every single throw on the field. And yeah, he's a little bit careless with the ball sometimes in his hand. He does try to extend some plays, does try to play a little be a hero ball. And that will lead to some fumbles. And that will, of course, lead to some turnovers. But you're getting about one, two of those plays a game max but you're also getting four to five plays a game where he's going to scramble around and get a first down where most quarterbacks would be dead in the water. So Caleb Williams, I think right up there with some of the best prospects we've seen in recent memory, right up there with Trevor Lawrence, right up there with Joe Burrow. I wouldn't quite put him up there with Andrew Luck, but he's a very strong prospect, very good football player and a great pick by the Chicago Bears. I think will be the first 4,000-yard passer in Bears history, as well as potentially the first 30-touchdown passer in Bears history. Now, with the second pick, again, I don't see Washington going anywhere. Quarterback is a massive need. And I think Jaden Daniels is right now a better quarterback than Drake May. Now, Drake May, I think, has a higher ceiling than Jaden Daniels. But going into year one, you need a guy to start. You need a guy to play. And I think you need a guy to fit the Washington and Cliff Kingsbury system. I think Jaden Daniels is the better fit for Washington. And I like him throwing to Terry McLaurin. I like him throwing to those wide receivers a little bit more. Then I like Drake May in that system. I think Jaden Daniels is a better runner, a better improviser. I think he's going to fit what Washington really likes. And honestly, I like the idea of him throwing the boundary to Terry McLaurin a little bit better than Drake May. I think Drake May needs a lot of footwork to work on. I think he has a lot of mechanical stuff to improve. So his ceiling is a lot higher than Jaden Daniels. Maybe not a lot, but it is higher than Jaden Daniels. Whereas I think Jaden Daniels' floor is pretty significantly higher than where Drake May is as of day one. And I think that is going to be a big factor as well as fit, obviously, as to who will be the second overall pick. But if I had to guess, I would probably assume it would be Jaden Daniels. Now, with the third overall pick, the Patriots have quite a few options. They could potentially trade down and try to get a haul of picks. They have a lot of needs on the roster and not enough draft picks to fill them. They could obviously go with Drake May, the best quarterback left in the la in the last true top tier quarterback in this year's draft class. They could go with Marvin Harrison Jr., arguably the best all around player in this draft class, regardless of position. So with that being said, there's a lot of ways they could go. But personally, I think they will go with Drake May. I think quarterback is just too big of a need not to address. And you get that fifth-year option, obviously, having a first-round selection. Drake May's ceiling is a top-10 quarterback in the NFL. And I just don't think you can pass on that if you're the Patriots, especially knowing what your quarterback situation has looked like since Tom Brady. Um, you know, obviously, your coaching staff still has to develop him. You still have to surround him with talent. You still have to surround him with weapons and protection. But the defense was really good last year. And if they can stay healthy, they should be a top 15, potentially a top 10 defense in New England. And I think Drake May is good enough in year one to hold and to kind of carry that New England offense to potentially a top 25, potentially a top 
top 20 offense, even if it kind of stays a little bit lackluster, which means the Patriots are going to show some pretty significant improvement. And then they're going to go into next year and have the opportunity to build a little bit more around Drake May, get him some offensive line, get him some wide receivers. And they're going to do that throughout the rest of the draft as well. But I think drafting Drake May here is better because I don't think you're going to necessarily be good enough for a quarterback next year. And you're certainly not going to get a quarterback of Drake May's caliber next year. So you might be throwing away his rookie season, but it's going to be a year to develop, a year to learn, a year to build around him, and then come back in year two of Drake May. And I think you're going to see the Patriots take a pretty big and significant step forward if they can properly develop Drake May into the right quarterback. Now. The Cardinals are on the clock. And once again, there are a couple of things that they could really, really do, right? Obviously, the big thing is trade down from four. But do you trade down from four if you want Marvin Harrison that badly? Do you trade down if you think, you know, you can get a top player? And I do think they will trade down, but I don't necessarily think it will be with the Minnesota Vikings. I think 11 is a very far way to fall for the Arizona Cardinals. I think they have enough picks. I don't think they really need any more picks, but obviously picking up a couple more in the top 100 would be great. But I don't think they want to fall out of that top seven, eight range because they do want an elite prospect. They do want a Marvin Harrison. They do want a Malik Neighbors. They do want a Romo Dunze or a Joe Alt or something of that caliber. But if there's a team that's going to trade up, I do think it could potentially be the New York Giants who want to make sure that the Minnesota Vikings don't go up and they don't take J.J. McCarthy off the board. And it's going to be a much easier cushion to fall back on for Arizona falling to six as opposed to falling to 11 and likely missing out on the big time receivers. So with that being said, do not necessarily care about the trade value here. I do think it will cost roughly a third, maybe a fourth day three pick swap or something like that, but don't worry about it. This, uh, this F where I wouldn't say as the most uh, fair trades, I guess you can put it that way. But since it's a one round mock, it doesn't really matter. We're just going to make sure the trade goes through. Um, I've tried it with, you know, a second, a third and a first for next year and it didn't go through. So the value is not necessarily important for this trade. Again, I think it will be closer to about a third round pick at the end of the day, but I do think that the Cardinals will trade down. I think New York could potentially not give up too much trade up secure J.J. McCarthy, and move forward with a young rookie quarterback. Give Brian Dable something to work with, and I think that you're really rolling and you're really getting a great player. Now, J.J. McCarthy is, I would say, a good football player. Um, I think Michigan kind of limited his reps because they didn't necessarily have to use J.J. McCarthy in the way that USC used Caleb Williams, in the way that LSU used Jaden Daniels, in the way that North Carolina used Drake May. But I don't think J.J. is necessarily a bad quarterback prospect. Is four a little bit rich? Sure. But the quarterback tax is that you have to get your guy high and you have to go get your guy when you need him or else somebody's going to jump you. Somebody's going to take that quarterback. Somebody is going to make a move. And with that being said, I think the Giants go up, they get their guy, they reset the quarterback, they get out of the Daniel Jones contract, and they start to build around a young player like J.J. McCarthy. And with a head coach like Brian Dable, I think he can use J.J.'s skills to his advantage. And I think we can see a really good quarterback in New York for the first time in, let's be honest, a couple of seasons. Now, going down to the Chargers, it says wide receiver is their biggest need. And while I do think that wide receiver would be great, obviously Marvin Harrison is falling a little bit in this draft. I just don't think Jim Harbaugh is going to draft a wide receiver at five. I don't think he's going to utilize a wide receiver at five to its full capacity. And with Greg Roman being the offensive coordinator, with Jim Harbaugh being the head coach, I think they're going to try to emulate Michigan. They're going to try to run the ball down everybody's throats. They signed J.K. Dobbins. They signed Gus Edwards. They are putting some stock in their offensive line. And I think the two best prospects left available are Marvin Harrison and Joe Alt. But I think Joe Alt is going to be a better fit. And I think Joe Alt is going to be more impactful for the style of offense that the Chargers are going to run as opposed to Marvin Harrison Jr., which means... The Arizona Cardinals are going to not only trade back and pick up an extra third round pick, but they're also going to get Marvin Harrison Jr. in an Arizona Cardinals uniform. Wide receiver just simply isn't that valuable of a position within the top five. And I know we've seen it in the past. I know that Jamar Chase went really high. I know that Jalen Waddle went at six, Jamar went at four. So it can happen. And I would not be surprised if either Arizona stuck at four and took Marvin Harrison Jr. or if the Chargers take Marvin Harrison Jr. But 
I think with the Chargers needing offensive line a little bit more and probably leaning on that offensive line more than their receiving core, they can come back and they can get a Ricky Pearsall in the second, a Malachi Corley in the second, maybe even an Xavier Leggett in the second round and potentially still get a really good wide receiver, but then get the best offensive tackle in the class and scheme the wide receivers open later that you're probably going to be throwing to a little bit less. So with Tennessee on the board, offensive tackle, and I think offensive line in general is by far the biggest need for this team. Wide receiver is certainly an option. Defense cornerback is certainly an option, but I don't think the value is quite there yet for the defensive side of the ball. And with that being said, I think that the Titans wanted Joe Alt. I think that's who's been mocked to them for most of the offseason. But I'm going to have them taking, I believe, Talise Funga. I believe so you say it from Oregon State. My second graded tackle in the class, I think much like Joe Alge, a very strong, very solid tackle, will plug and play for probably 10, maybe 15 years. He'll be a great tackle for a long time for them, a cornerstone piece, a easy, simple piece to add, protect Will Levis, give him time to throw the football, and I think it's the right option for an offensive coach in an offensive system that is getting a new coach that is known for developing offensive line. You get the offensive linemen, you develop them to protect your quarterback, and you get a really good starting spot for a rebuilding franchise. Now, going over to the Atlanta Falcons. Edge rusher is a very popular pick here. Dallas Turner is a very popular pick. I've seen guys like Teron Arnold be at this pick. But part of me really, really thinks that Romo Dunze is going to be the pick here. And I know that's a very Arthur Smith-esque pick, right? It would give, obviously the fourth year in a row that they've drafted a skill position in the top 10. You have Kyle Pitts, then Drake, then Drake London, then Bijan, and now Roma Dunze. But I think that the way the Falcons have structured their roster, they don't have a wide receiver too, right? Obviously, Darnell Mooney is a Falcon, but I think he's a really good slot wide receiver. I think he's going to be really good as your wide receiver three, but I don't see a true wide receiver two for Kirk Cousins to throw to yet. And I think giving him an offense with a really good offensive line, a top five offensive line in football, Drake London, Romo Dunze, Kyle Pitts, and then obviously Bijan Robinson and Tyler Algier in the backfield, you're talking about a potential top five offense in the NFL with the quarterback to get the football to all of those players. I didn't think their defense was necessarily bad a season ago. I like some of the edge rushers and the cornerbacks on day two. I think you can pass up on the defense to get arguably a top 10 wide receiver, well, a top 10 prospect, obviously a top 10 wide receiver in the class, but I think Romo Dunze is a better football player than the rest of the guys left on the board. And I honestly think that the Falcons would probably be wrong to not add this guy to their offense and really complete an offense to potentially take the South next year. Now, taking a look at Chicago, Malik Neighbors is on the board. A lot of people are going to want Malik Neighbors, and I think it's a potential option for them. I don't think Malik Neighbors is necessarily an X wide receiver, but they don't necessarily need an X because DJ Moore is playing that role really well. Keenan Allen is playing that role really, really well. But I also don't necessarily think that he is going to be the number one option here. I think Malik Neighbors is a potential guy that's going to fall every time he plays NFL caliber corners, whether it be Terrion Arnold, Kool-Aid McKinstry, the Florida State duo. He's really been less effective than you'd want to see. And I think he is a better slot and a better Z wide receiver. Whereas I think Brock Bowers is a better football player. I think he's going to get open more for Chicago. I think he's going to be a better utilized tool for Caleb Williams. And you get an offense now where instead of either Keenan Allen or Malik neighbors, not being utilized to their full potential, you have Brock Bowers, who is going to be a severe upgrade over Cole Komet. Cole Komet being now one of the best tight end twos in the NFL. And you still go forward with a great receiver duo a great tight end duo a solid running back and I think you can add some offensive line pieces later but Brock Bowers is I think going to be drafted in the top 10 and I do think there's a good shot that the Bears take him over Malik Neighbors because I think it will be more impactful I guess and they won't take away from the guy that they just traded for about a month and a half ago now the New York Jets are on the clock and I do think they will go offensive tackle. They have a they have a quarterback that is made of glass. They need to protect him. They didn't protect anybody this year very well. And I think Troy Fatanu from Washington is the right pick here. I think he's a little bit more structurally sound than Olu Fashionu and I think while Olu is really really good, I do think he could fall because he's much more of a raw athlete than some of the other tackles taken very early. 
And then Minnesota's on the clock. And while Minnesota, again, can go a lot of different ways, I think Malik Neighbors would be a fun storyline. I think that Olu Fashanu could be interesting if they do want to trade away a tackle at some point. Dallas Turner as an edge rusher could be interesting, although they did already have um, two free agents come in to kind of fill that role. I think they go with a little bit of a swing. I don't think they're going to take a a quarterback here necessarily. I think 11 is a little too high for either Bo Nix or Michael Penix. But I do think they're going to try to take the best defensive tackle available. And even though they're reaching down the board a little bit, I do think Byron Murphy fits a lot of what they're going to look for in a defensive tackle. I think he's a great football player. I think he's arguably the best defensive tackle in the class as a pure run-stopping defensive tackle that will help the defense out at the front and obviously make it a much better situation for the defense in the back. Byron Murphy is a really strong player. I think Minnesota would love to have him. And even though he's not quite the pass rushing nuance that a guy like Johnny Newton has, I think Byron Murphy is potentially a better run supporter, a potential better all around defensive lineman. And I think that that is going to give him the nod over Johnny Newton in this scenario. Now for the Denver Broncos, I have them trading back and not necessarily trading back because they don't want a player here, but more so because I think the Colts are going to try to trade up. I think the Colts see at 15 that the best cornerbacks are still available on the board, and they're going to try to put together a pick, and they're going to try to put together some, some kind of package to move up for the 12th overall pick, which this should be accepted. Again, don't worry too much about the compensation. That's definitely not what's going to happen in real life. And I think they're going to take Quinion Mitchell. Quinion Mitchell is arguably the best cornerback in this class. He's very patient on routes. He sits on routes really well. He showed at the Senior Bowl that he is not afraid. <coughs> he showed at the Senior Bowl that he is not afraid to step into a press man coverage role and take away some of the best receivers at an all-star game. And I do think Quinion Mitchell is potentially the best cornerback on the board, potentially the best defensive player in the draft. And even though he's not the first defensive player taken, I do think that he is the best cornerback in the class. I think he's got great size, great speed, great explosiveness, good ball skills. Like there really isn't a whole lot to doubt about Quinion Mitchell's game. I think he's a little bit more technically developed than a guy like Terry on Arnold. So moving down to the 13th overall pick, I think that the Raiders are going to take a quarterback. I do not think they are happy with, I think, what is it? Gardner Minshew, I think is their quarterback right now, or Aiden O'Connell. I don't think they're happy with that. I think Bo Nix is a better quarterback than people give him credit for. He led the NCAA in passing yards a season ago, and I think he is a really good fit for them. Right, He's going to go to a place with Jacoby Myers and Devontae Adams and Josh Jacobs. He's going to be in a system with guys that can get him yak after the catch. He's going to be in a system that I think can play to his strengths. And I do think that Bo Nix fits a little bit of what the Raiders are looking for. Now, for those of you that are noticing, obviously some of these big-time players are falling down the draft, and Malik Neighbors especially is going to continue to fall. As with the 14th overall pick, I think the New Orleans Saints, not really being in big need of a wide receiver either, are going to draft an offensive tackle in Olu fashion new one of the better prospects in this offensive tackle class one of the best athletes if not the best athlete at the offensive tackle position this offseason i think olu fashion is a very talented prospect i think that really for the most part he was sound and he was stable for penn state all year really struggled against power when he played against ohio state but other than that, he's a really solid prospect, very good at what he does, and I think that the Saints need a little bit of structure on offense, and I think Olu Fashanu is a safer pick, and I think it is a good pick for the New Orleans Saints. Now, the fall of Dallas Turner is officially over, as I think Denver goes back to the defensive side of the ball. Yes, they need quarterback. Yes, they need defensive tackle. Yes, they need wide receiver, but... I think that Sean Payton is going to try to fix the defense first. The defense was atrocious to start the season. The defense was not great to end the season. They had a little bit of a stretch where they were very, very good. But I think they're going to try to get their next Von Miller. They're going to try to add some stuff on the defensive side of the ball. And I think Sean Payton has the confidence in himself. I think he has the confidence in the play calling right now to go out and put up some decent points. Right, You have Cortland Sutton. You have some wide receivers there. You have not a whole lot on offense, honestly, but you don't have a whole lot on defense either. And I think getting a cornerstone offensive piece, not reaching for a quarterback, not reaching for you know the fifth, sixth offensive lineman, not reaching for, you know, 
the, I guess, technically what third, fourth wide receiver in this class would not be a bad option either, but I just truly don't see Malik neighbors being that highly drafted. I think he does fall in this class. And I don't think Seattle takes them either. They have three really strong wide receivers. And I think Seattle is going to go interior offensive line. I think they're going to take the first center slash guard off the board. And it's going to be Jackson powers Johnson. I think the best interior lineman of the class and somebody that I think is going to be incredibly successful for a long, long time in the NFL. Now, at 17, I think this is where Malik Neighbors finally stops the fall. And a lot of people are going to disagree, and a lot of people are going to say, yeah, Malik Neighbors is going to go higher than this. Malik Neighbors probably will go higher than this. But I think going through, you know, you look at, obviously, the top picks, quarterback, 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 quarterback. Joe Ald, I think, is a better fit, like I said. Marvin Harrison's obviously the first quarterback. Probably not a wide receiver. I think Odunze is better. Maybe, potentially. Maybe, potentially, but again, I think offensive tackle is better. Probably not, probably not, maybe, probably not, maybe, and no. So there's really only three or four opportunities for Malik Neighbors to go in you know, any pick before this, and I think that Malik Neighbors is a great fit for the Jaguars. The Jaguars need a wide receiver after losing Calvin Ridley, and I think it would be a good opportunity. Malik Neighbors works out of the slot. Malik Neighbors is a Z wide receiver. I think he's going to help Trevor Lawrence a ton, and I think it's a great fit. I think it's a great pick overall. Now, with the Bengals, Offensive line could certainly be in play. I think defensive line could certainly be in play. But after losing DJ Reader this past offseason, I think they're going to try to replace him with the best defensive tackle on the market. And they're going to try to go after Johnny Newton, the defensive tackle from Illinois. Arguably the best interior pass rusher of his class. A great player. The Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. A tenacious pass rusher and somebody that's going to get you a lot of pressure on the interior. Pairing him with Trey Hendrickson would give the Bengals a pretty good front four and a really good pass rush to go after the AFC North. And I think with Joe Burrow returning, potentially with T Higgins coming back as well, because I don't know if he's going to get traded or not, that gives the Bengals a really solid roster, a really strong construction, and I think it's going to put them in position to succeed immediately and not take a step back on the defensive side of the ball. Now, cornerback, again, is a massive need for the LA Chargers, but I really do like the depth at cornerback in this class, and while I do think that Terion Arnold is very much worthy of the 19th overall pick, I think that potentially Jared Averse might be the Rams guy. They just lost a big-time pass rusher in Aaron Donald. They do have the young rookie that was great last year at nine sacks for them, but I think putting Jared Averse on that defensive line, giving the Rams another great pass rusher for the defense is going to be good, and I think you can get a better cornerback on day two than you can a pass rusher on day two, which leads, obviously, the Rams to select the guy that they're going to have a better chance of developing on the defensive side of the football. For the Steelers, I think interior offensive line is super, super crucial. I'm going to give them Graham Barton. Graham Barton can play either center or guard or tackle. He can play pretty much every position on the offensive line. Again, it's a safe pick for the Steelers, but it's a pick that I think will make them better immediately and be a really strong component for their offensive line for a very, very long time. And the Dolphins is pretty simple as well. They're going to draft offensive line. I think CJ Latham is really, really strong. And I think he's going to be a great fit for the Miami Dolphins. Two against the football out fast. All you got to do is protect him for a couple of seconds. I think CJ Latham can do even a better job than that. And I think that he is going to be a great fit for the Dolphins. With the Philadelphia Eagles, the easy pick here is Terion Arnold, arguably the quickest cornerback in the draft, somebody with elite makeup speed, elite ball production a season ago. Terion Arnold also being out of the Alabama Crimson Tide, not quite the Georgia Bulldogs, but right up there as an SEC program. And we know how much Howie Roseman likes his SEC corners. I think that Terion Arnold is the natural fit here, and I think that it is going to be the right fit for the Minnesota or for the Philadelphia Eagles. Next up is the Minnesota Vikings, where again, Michael Penix is on the board, and Michael Penix could certainly be an option. I think offensive guard or offensive center, right? I think that Zach Frazier or potentially a guy like Christian Hayes is certainly on the board. You take a look at some of the other needs, like cornerback. Cornerback is an option with obviously Nate Wiggins and Cooley McKinstry. But I don't necessarily buy the rumors that Minnesota is going to wait till next year. I don't think next year's quarterback class is all that great. And I think if they have the chance to take Michael Penix at 23, they are going to do so. And I think that they are going to be happy with that decision. Michael Penix is a very smart passer. He is a very good passer of the football. His arm is not bad, although it is not elite. And I do think that there's a lot to work with there for Michael Penix for the Vikings to be really 
really excited about. Now, taking a look down the board a little bit, the... The Dallas Cowboys are on the board. An offensive tackle is a big need for them. Offensive line, keeping Dak Prescott healthy is big. I think Amarius Mims is the guy for them. I think he's going to be a strong, again, offensive tackle for a long time. This offensive tackle class is really, really strong, and it's going to have probably five, six, maybe even seven tackles taken in the first round, as well as a couple of interior guys. I think it is a great pick for them, and I think it is going to be a great move for Dallas, potentially improving the running game as well as protecting the quarterback, which is never a bad option. Now, the Green Bay Packers, I just have this feeling that it's going to be Cooper DeGene. I feel like they're going to add their secondary. They are going to add a cornerback slash safety slash slot cornerback, a guy that can move all around the defense. Just feels to me like a Green Bay Packers type of player. Offensive line, again, is in play, but I'm not sure if you're going to reach an offensive guard here in the first round. Linebacker is certainly in play as well. I do think that... I can't remember his name right now, but yeah, Edron Cooper is certainly in play as well. But I just, I get the feeling, and you can disagree for sure. I just get the feeling that Cooper DeGene is going to be a Green Bay Packer. And with that being said, I also get the feeling that Leatu Latu is probably going to be a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. I think Leatu Latu is a much better player than the 26th overall pick in the class, but I do think that there is a good chance that he falls in the class due to injury concerns. Obviously, the medicals are a big problem. If they turn out to be bigger than any of us really realize, there's a good chance that Latu potentially falls out of the first round entirely. I think the upside is too good to let that happen, and 26 feels like a very natural position for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and I think they'd be a much better football team adding Latu than if they were to not. Now, it's getting a little close to the Lions pick, and I think they want a cornerback. I think they have a cornerback in mind, and they want to trade up with the Arizona Cardinals. Again, draft compensation is not a big deal. I'm assuming it's going to cost maybe a fourth, maybe a third-round pick next year to move up for the 27th pick from 29. But moving up, skipping the Bills, skipping the Cardinals, who very well could take a cornerback, I think Kool-Aid McKinstry is the Detroit Lions guy. I think he plays great man coverage. I think he's a really good athlete. I think he's a really good leader. This feels like the guy that Brad Holmes has had his eye on for the longest time. This feels like the guy that Brad Holmes really wants. If he's not going to be able to get Terry on Arnold in the first round, he's going to move up for Kool-Aid McKinstry for the third year in a row is going to draft the wider is for the third year in a row is going to draft a playmaker from Alabama who wears the number one. The number one is open on the roster. And I think Kool-Aid McKinstry fits with the Lions like in cornerbacks. I think he is the perfect fit scheme-wise for Aaron Glenn's defense. And I think pairing him with Carlton Davis could truly give the Detroit Lions their first elite cornerback since the departure of Darius Slay over five seasons ago. The Buffalo Bills are on the clock, and there's been some talk about them trading up for a wide receiver. But with all of the talent in the wide receiving room, I think Brian Thomas is going to be that guy. I personally like A.D. Mitchell a little bit better. But I think the pick will be Brian Thomas just because he's a little bit bigger. He's not quite as fast, but he does have more size than A.D. Mitchell. Doesn't necessarily have the character concern. Doesn't quite have the character concerns. And I think will be a great fit for the Buffalo Bills. Moving back down to Arizona. I think it would be kind of hilarious if they drafted A.D. Mitchell and they just paired him with Marvin Harrison Jr. And you gave Kyler Murray two young rookie wide receiver playmakers. But honestly, they need help on the defensive side of the ball. You're not going to draft another defensive tackle in the first. So Nate Wiggins feels like the right pick. Elite speed, pretty good ball production. I think it's bullied off the ball a little bit by more physical wide receivers. So when you play DK Metcalf and when you play Debo Samuel twice a year, that might give you some trouble. But if Nate Wiggins can put on a few pounds, if Nate Wiggins can put on some weight, I think he'll be a really strong cornerback in the NFL. And I think it's going to be a great pick for them. I think the Ravens go add an I Mitchell. I think wide receiver, despite drafting Zay Flowers in the first year ago, they could still very much use another wide receiver. A.D. Mitchell is a great route runner. He's got great hands. And yeah, he has some personality issues, I think, with the, the diabetes and with whatever he's got going on. And I do think that is a real concern from what I have read, but I don't think it's a big enough concern to ignore the fact that this is one of the most talented guys in the first round, one of the most talented wide receivers at the position this year. And it's going to be a great fit for for the Baltimore Ravens and give Lamar Jackson another weapon to truly work with in year two without Greg Roman and really air the football out. Give the MVP another weapon after Odell Beckham left. And I think Adonai Mitchell is a great pick there. And then 
the San Francisco 49ers. I think offensive tackle is huge. I think offensive tackle is what they really, really need. On the defensive side of the ball, cornerback is a need for them. But again, I don't think TJ Tampa is really the move right here. Defensive tackle, you're not going to draft. Offensive guard, you might. But I think tackle is a little bit of a bigger deal. Edge rusher is certainly an option as well after you losing it. Chase Young. I think it comes down between Chop Robinson and Tyler Guyton. Chop Robinson's a little bit raw. Tyler Guyton, I think, can start immediately if they need him to. And I think Tyler Guyton is going to be the move there. Although I do think linebackers in play as well because Dre Greenlaw probably won't be healthy to start the season. But as is, is now, I do have Tyler Guyton going to the San Francisco 49ers. And then the Chiefs are going to make the most Chiefs-like move ever. They're going to draft a speedy wide receiver who is going to give Patrick Mahomes the ability to stretch the field, pair him with Hollywood Brown, and there it is that you have my 2024 official mock draft for the NFL. Obviously, the first couple of picks are chalky, right? Caleb, Jaden, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy early. Marvin Harrison falls a little bit. Malik Neighbors falls a whole lot. There's a couple of players that are going to go earlier than you expect, a couple of players that are going to go later than you expect. But I think every single team would probably be happy with the way that this turns out. Obviously, if you're a fan of a team and you don't like the pick, let me know down in the comments below. Let me let me know who you would have rather your team taken in this situation. I think this works out pretty much well for all 32 teams. I think everybody gets good value. Everybody gets the players that they need to work forward. And I think it's going to be a really exciting day going into day two with guys like Chop Robinson falling to the second round, a couple of really good cornerbacks, a couple of great wide receivers, and just some all around really, really talented guys. Well, all of that being said, that is my official 2024 mock draft for the upcoming season. We'll see if it comes true later today. But with all of that being said, that's all I got for you guys right now. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, and as always, go Lions.